you for joining us today for our first ever alumni conversations. Uh, our goal of alumni conversations is to bring our alumni and their experiences directly to you. My name is Jennifer Nanny and I am the Director of Alumni Relations here at UNTHSC. Today's conversation will be recorded and we do ask that you stay on mute until we take additional questions at the end. I did want to say thank you to all, all those who were able to submit questions in advance. We will definitely try our best to get to all of them. We also have Hannah Gambrell, our Alumni Relations Manager. She is monitoring the chat, so if you have questions throughout the conversation, please feel free to share them there and we will try to also address those at the end. Joining us today for today's conversation is Dr. Ryan O'Neill. He is TCOM class of 2008 alumnus and he is an emergency medicine physician based in New York. Welcome, Dr. O'Neill. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, we know that you work nights, so we really appreciate you sacrificing your time and your sleep to share your experiences with us. But to go ahead and get started, um, please tell us a little bit about yourself, your current role, and what ultimately led you to choose emergency medicine over the other specialties you are considering. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm originally from San Antonio, Texas, so I grew up in, um, in the... Uh, Texas and uh, went to uh, Texas A&M for undergrad and then obviously TCOM graduated 2008. Um, I worked as a paramedic um, actually during undergrad, I mean, yeah, during undergrad um, and uh, that's one thing that sparked my interest in emergency medicine um, and then it kind of just went on from there. Um, I was inspired by my sister, my older sister who went into uh, uh, EMS and then nursing prior to that um, and then uh, just throughout my rotations in med school I was interested in a little bit of everything so I like certain aspects of every specialty like OB or orthopedics anesthesia and then I kind of just went from there um, um, and uh, I basically liked seeing everything so that's why I went into emergency medicine because you do see everything um, and get to experience a little bit of everything. I did my residency, um, actually I was in the Air Force, so I did Air Force scholarship. So my first year, I ended up doing an internship um, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It was an internal medicine in internship. And then after that, we applied to get the uh, spot in the military and I got a civilian spot. So I went to Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh and did a three year residency there. And then did three years of, or not, sorry, four years of time at um, Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. Got deployed once. Um, and then um, when I was in Las Vegas, that's where I met my wife. And she's from New York. So that's how I ended up on Long Island. And I've been working at Huntington Hospital, which is part of at the big Northwell Hospital Group. It's uh, the biggest uh, hospital system on Long Island. Um, since July 2016. And of course, I have been here uh, in the busiest, uh, uh, the epicenter of this outbreak. Yeah. It's quite busy here on Long Island, um, just like it is in the city. I can imagine. Thank you so much for your service. And I'm going to actually ask you to put yourself back in the mindset of a student for a moment. If you could go back to TCOM, what advice would you give yourself? Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna, oh yeah, that's like way back. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, as a student, of course, um, I would try to, you know, obviously during my first and second year, if you're interested in uh, going into emergency medicine or any specialty, uh, try to get some uh, hands-on experience and, and shadow uh, with physicians, uh, even prior to your um, third and fourth year rotations, um, just to make sure that you're, you know, you're really interested in the specialty, obviously you're gonna experience it during your rotations. But just try to get as much hands-on experience as you can. Uh, we have scribes where I work and that's um, something that um, if I didn't do BMS, that's something I would consider because it's amazing what they get to see. They, right now they're not going in the rooms with us for just dictating to them to keep them safe. But I mean, they um, get to experience everything and uh, it's a great learning experience for them. So I would, I would consider that. Absolutely. Is there anything you wish you would have known better to prepare yourself for your clinical rotations? I know being a scribe would probably be helpful for that, but anything? I, mean, 
I don't know. I mean, I did EMS, so I got some good experience from that. Um, maybe I would have done a few more shadowing shifts. Um, I did go out to, actually, I went all the way out to Parkland a couple of times. And um, I think actually it was Dr. Fowler, I believe, who, was, who I worked with. It's been many years ago. Um, it was in the ER there, but maybe I would have done some more of those uh, shadow shifts early. So um, what was life like as a resident? It sounds like you had quite the experience before you got to residency and then had some great experience in Allegheny County and Pittsburgh. Um, did you face any sort of stigma when you were a resident, um, stigma as a DO, um, also being kind of the newest person on the totem pole? Yeah, well, I mean, as a, as a resident, um, so I'll say it was a combination of things. It was, uh, it was uh, fun. It was uh, very busy and a little bit terrifying because uh, especially during your first year, um, during your first year, you're just trying to learn everything. Um, and then, um, yeah, it's just kind of like drinking from a water hose initially, certain, especially during certain rotations, like the trauma rotations. Um, I mean, at least the hours aren't so bad in emergency medicine when you're on your emergency medicine rotations. Um, especially at the hours restrictions and everything, but you know, I mean, I was, you know, you're young and full of energy, you can handle it. Um, I didn't really face any um, significant stigma though. I think maybe I had one or two patients during residency who maybe just didn't understand the difference between a DO and an MD. Um, but I had more patients that came up to me and said, hey, I have a primary care doctor who's a DO. I love DOs. It's amazing um, how they approach uh, patients and um, just kind of their, you know, hands-on, like, full um, comprehensive approach. And I got more compliments than uh, stigma, so. That's wonderful. So you've mentioned drinking um, water from a water hose, or I might have phrase that incorrectly, but how do you maintain your work-life balance when you are in residency and then, I guess, post-residency? You know, it's a new normal, so. Well, yeah, and also it, it depends on what position you are in your life. So, I mean, you know, when I was in residency, um, I was single, so, I mean, obviously there's less uh, home responsibilities there. I mean, I know it's going to be different if you um, are married, have children, obviously, uh, that uh, adds a new element to it. But I mean, um, what I did is during residency, one of the things I like to do was um, I was uh, running half marathons and marathons, just trying to keep yourself physically active. Um, try to get sleep when you can. And um, just, uh, I had a really a great group of re co-residents and, um, and attendings and just uh, the, the whole team, um, we uh, kept our morale up. We would have um, a lot of, uh, times where we would hang out um, and uh, they had uh, Halloween parties, Christmas parties, just a lot of different in the resident retreats at the beginning of the year. We would go whitewater rafting um, down in uh, uh, Pennsylvania near the uh, border with West Virginia. But you just have to do those little things and stay active and get plenty of sleep to keep yourself sane, basically. Makes sense. Sleep is a cure-all, I think, for a lot of people. So, um, yeah. do you? I know you and I had talked about this previously. Um, just how your hospital right now, um, with residencies changing and whatnot. But do you expect most residencies to possibly be extended, or um, obviously they're interrupted right now due to many doctors having to redirect their focus? Um, yeah. Um I don't know if I have the exact answer to that because I, I don't work at a, at a uh, academic center per se. We do get residents that rotate through um, as a community ED shift, um, but I think they might have to extend it um, a little bit because um, certainly the, the volume of patients uh, definitely overall went down. Obviously we had a lot of sick COVID patients, so we had a peak here in like early mid April, um, but the uh, thing is, a lot of people uh, with other complaints were staying away from the emergency department, which is kind of scary because obviously people are still having uh, uh, MIs and strokes. It's not like 
these things aren't happening, but they're, they're staying away. So um, you do, for a couple of months, you're missing out, out on those experiences and those patients. But maybe they would have to extend um, residency by a few months. Yeah. But, and, and I'm not the authority on that, but I imagine that. I mean, obviously you're getting, this is a terrible experience, but it's a, it's a learning experience at the same time. Something that we never have seen before, or at least I've never personally dealt with. So, so that's actually a great transition. Um, can you tell us about your experience as an emergency medicine physician in the height of this current pandemic? Um, tell us kind of what it was like in the early days, how it's evolved and changed over the last few months, if you wouldn't mind sharing that. Well, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I work um, in Huntington, New York. So it's about 40 minute drive uh, from the city. Um, obviously it's a very densely populated area. So very crowded with uh, COVID patients. So, I mean, initially um, we would see, so even before um, we started testing uh, for COVID-19, uh, we did notice that there were some uh, patients that were coming in that were really sick with uh, pneumonia. Um, and uh, that was still when we were, uh, um, the flu season was kind of started to uh, come down a little bit. And we would test them for, uh, we'd do a viral panel test them for flu and they were negative for flu. Um, but they had, we came in really sick with, with severe pneumonia. So I suspect that we had cases even before um, yeah, we, it was really well known. And then just kind of in early April, it was slowly starting to pick up. Um, at the at the peak of it, right, um, maybe a week before um, Easter, going into Easter, there would be shifts that had come on at nights where we would have uh, every room filled with uh, patients that uh, were suspected of uh, COVID-19. And there was one night where um, we had three intubations in uh, about the span of 45 minutes. Um, we actually, because they canceled the elective surgeries in our hospital, we actually had anesthesia on standby to help us out with these intubations because they weren't um, in the OR um, doing the We uh, have great resources in the health system to help out the bird. Um, this is definitely pretty scary. Uh, I mean, there's patients uh, that presented with uh, uh, strokes, um, and they're in their 40s and uh, like 40, early 40s to, to, to 50s, um, and just people that you wouldn't expect to be uh, that sick would come in um, with uh, severe viral pneumonia and hypoxia. Like one guy that really struck me was he's like in his early 50s, like 51, 52. And I walked in the room and I saw he was wearing like a, a hat, like a race hat. It looked like he was a triathlete. I said, hey, are you a, are you are you, are you a triathlete? He's like, yeah, I don't have any medical problems. I'm very fit. Um, the first thing he noticed a few days ago was that he just couldn't uh, run or even walk without getting tired and it uh, progressed very quickly uh, to the point where he was yeah, on nasal, on nasal cannula, sat in the uh, low 80s and uh, in distress, and we put him on a non-regriever and admitted him. He, I think he was actually, uh, he wasn't intubated in ED, but I think he was intubated a few days later. Wow. And then people, there's people in their, people in their 40s, like young people, most of them with uh, comorbidities like hypertension and diabetes, but some people that hadn't seen a doctor in, in years um, and may have had some underlying issues that they didn't know about. Um, it, unfortunately, it's hit um, in, our, in our community at my hospital. Um, it's um, basically hit the, uh, kind of the Latino community a lot harder. So. Um, we have in our in our area Latino communities, uh, people from like, El Salvador, Honduras, mostly like Central South America. But it's definitely hit them a lot harder. But it's and now it's tapering off. We're having less COVID patients. Our um, admitted patients. Um, we've actually discharged over 700 patients with COVID at my hospital. So that's pretty impressive. We have a board 
um, when you walk into work every day that updates the people that were discharged. So that's inspiring to see how many people have left. Absolutely. Yeah, that have been successfully discharged. Some of them have come back, but you know, most of them have. I mean, it's, we've, we've discharged quite a few people and we have, uh, at one point we had 50 people on ventilators in the hospital. Now I think we are at like 13 people on ventilators. But yeah, the people are sick for a long time. They're on, they're on ventilators for weeks. Like, could be on the ventilator for up to a month. And dialysis, uh, we don't do ECMO at my hospital, but um, one of our sister hospitals, uh, North Shore, and I think at LA, at Long Island Jewish, they do uh, ECMO. So we have people on ECMO and stuff. It's, 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 it's pretty crazy. But right now, they, we're kind of going back to normal in the ER. Mm -hmm. where we're seeing more of the uh, patients that we are used to seeing and uh, less of the COVID patients. That's good. That does have to be pretty inspiring, though, to come into work every day and get to see that board. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so have you had any challenges that you've had to deal with? And if so, how did you come up with solutions to overcome those challenges? And is that uh, related to this uh, pandemic or just in general? Um, it could be both. Yeah, mostly I'm sure it seemed like this question followed with the pandemic question, but oh, yeah. um, I, I imagine both. The audience would be curious about both. Well, I mean, as far as uh, related to the pandemic, um, I mean, initially, initially we were concerned that we were going to be short on PPE. Because that's one of the major challenges not really anything that I was able to solve on my own, but luckily I am fortunate enough to work uh, for a well-resourced uh, health system. Um, it's a huge health system um, in, in the New York uh, area. Um, but at one point I was terrified that they were talking about, you know, the, the CDC was talking about how we might have to put on bandanas and stuff if we ran out of surgical masks. Um, at that point, I was thinking, you know, if, if I had been told to put on a bandana, I don't know if, how am I going to safely go to work. But luckily, we were able to um, actually get the, the PPE that we need. We, and we've had the PPE that we need. Um, but we've been able to get a new N95 mask every shift, so we're not having to reuse them um, several, several days. Um, and then just, um, and then just the challenges also are, you know, kind of stress related to everything that's going on. Every, uh, everybody is experiencing that across the country in one way or the other. Um, but my hospital is, uh, given us resources and support groups and and, um, and they've been and the community has been very supportive as well too okay. had a lot of praise from the community people uh, sending us uh, uh, food and, and gifts and all kinds of stuff That's which awesome. is very helpful on night shift i bet it is me not even having to worry about a meal i'm sure is one saving grace that was actually my next question which you answered so thank you for that we are um you know, we've heard a lot of people struggling and it's good to know that your hospital is providing resources to all of you as you deal with everything. So how do you see the pandemic impacting the future of healthcare? Um, I know you mentioned PPE and you have that, and you're lucky that at your hospital you have that, but I know there are some others in the nation that are not experiencing the same thing. Um, also, we've heard a lot about telehealth and then patient contact. Um, how do you see that kind of evolving the next few months and few years? Well, yeah, I mean, I think um, especially in certain specialties, um, I think telehealth will probably play a, a larger role. Um, and I'm not sure um, if that's going to remain permanent once there's, uh, if there is a, a reliable vaccine and, um, it, and we're able to obtain the proper herd immunity that we need. Obviously, though, this is kind of, shown that um, you know this is concerning because this could have this could happen again I mean we have to be prepared for the next pandemic that may occur so I'm, I assume that the policies will definitely change on at least where I'm at and wearing PPE 
um, even on a regular shift. Maybe not an N95 every time we go to work, but probably at least a surgical mask. And um, hopefully uh, this will um, prompt uh, all health, health systems to uh, get the supplies that they need and have them on, on stock. Um, as far as, I mean, emergency medicine, obviously there's not really any uh, option uh, to stay away from the office, so to speak. Um, but we are, we are um, doing, uh, we are doing callbacks and we're actually doing some telehealth on patients. So we have a system set up to where if we see a patient that may not be able to get into their, well, won't be able to get into their position for the next few months to follow up. Um, say if we drain an abscess or something or do something that would be um, that we could follow up on um, we uh, set them up in the system and then uh, we're going to set up a shift for uh, one of our providers to uh, call them back and do a video chat with them so we are setting up our own telehealth follow-up that's awesome so, yeah for certain patients and certain complaints absolutely I think that's great. You know, cardiologist, and they need to they need to speak to follow up with a cardiologist. But. Yeah. No, I think that's wonderful. I think patients would probably really appreciate that too. So, um, so kind of we're seeing the U.S. is slowly starting to open back up, but we've seen a lot of conflicting advice and opinions in the media as to whether or not it's safe. From your standpoint, um, for someone that is trying to sift through all of the information, what recommendations or advice would you give them? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, this is so hard uh, to say. I mean, I know every state and every region is experiencing this differently. Um, and uh, you have to, uh, there are real risks uh, to keeping everybody shut down for, for an extended period of time. I mean, obviously, there's a danger of uh, the, the virus itself, uh, but there's also a very real danger of uh, people being out of work and uh, also being afraid to go to the uh, hospital and not getting the uh, uh, elective surgeries and the uh, other care that they need. Um, and like I said earlier, it's not like people are um, not having uh, chest pain or, or strokes uh, anymore just because this happened. So. Um, I've seen people that have come in uh, later saying that, well, I was afraid to go to the hospital, but I've been having this chest pain for a while. And uh, they end up, uh, you see their EKG, and it's like, oh, yeah, you probably had an MI uh, during these last couple of weeks. And, and there's also, I mean, certain elective surgeries that are very important, like if someone, or, and also diagnostic studies that people may need. You know, may miss like a diagnosis of uh, cancer on someone um, at first for several months and kind of uh, slow down their uh, treatment uh, diagnosis and treatment process so it's really hard to say it's going to be different by region um, i think you have to definitely take a stepwise approach and kind of see how how things are going in your area and i I would definitely support, obviously, I definitely support social distancing and I think people wearing face coverings is a good idea just because like they say, it's not really so much to protect yourself, but it's if you are infected, um, it definitely does help keep you from infecting others. So if everybody wears a mask when they're going into enclosed spaces, especially, then that will certainly help. Absolutely. And also there, you know, cause there's also effects on people's mental health and there's people, there's a lot of people, vulnerable people out there that have history of drug abuse and alcohol abuse and stuff like that. And I know that this lockdown has been kind of increasing people, like causing people to relapse. Yeah. So that's, yeah. I know I don't have, so I don't think anyone has the exact answer for every region, to be honest. But I think it's great advice, though, to yeah, just trying to figure it out as we go. Absolutely. We're still learning. Yeah. And I imagine it will continue to evolve the more we find out about the research and when the vaccine becomes available and all of that. So, yeah. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, it could be applicable to 
everything you've experienced with the pandemic, but have you ever had a situation, a patient or a colleague that has had a positive impact on you um, throughout your medical experience? And if so, how? Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's just one particular patient, obviously. Uh, um, all my all my colleagues that I'm working with right now are definitely having a positive impact on me. I mean, everybody's been um, very uh, strong and uh, inspiring during this um, uh, this whole situation, just in general. Um, that's what I love about emergency medicine is that it's a real team approach, and that uh, you have to you work well with everybody uh, in the team, from the uh, housekeeping staff to the techs to the nurses and to the other physicians, and you get to work with every specialty. Um, but I think, in general, um, some of my uh, pediatric experiences in the emergency department um, were uh, very inspiring. I mean, some of them were quite frightening, but uh, it's it's amazing when you're able to um, like resuscitate a a newborn. Um, and it goes from super scary situation to an inspiring situation when you get to resuscitate a newborn. And then, obviously, we have to transfer them out of our hospital, so I don't get to see them once they're transferred out. But I, I did. I you know I had one that was like four days old um, that. Um, ended up having, was having seizures and uh, had to intubate and they um, ended up really hypo, they were hypoglycemic um, and they ended up transferring them out and uh, I saw them later and I saw their parents later and one of them works for the uh, EMS actually in my health system. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they had uh, thanked me about what we did with their, their newborn and how we helped them out. That's, I think the pediatric the pediatric cases always stand out, though. So the thing with kids in the emergency department is most of the time they're very well um, and they're just kind of coming in for something like a fever and they have a cold. But uh, when they're you know when they're really sick, it's uh, definitely uh, gets your gets your adrenaline up and um, it, it it can be it's terrifying and rewarding at the same time. Absolutely, well, and I'm sure you have, by doing that, you've had a profound impact on those individuals' lives that they will always remember. So I can imagine how that would have a positive impact on you, so. Oh, absolutely. So, well, at this time, we now have asked all the questions that we have. So if anyone in the audience has a question, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask Dr. O'Neill directly, or you can type it in the chat feature and Hannah will read that out. Um, so we actually had one come in from a student um, to the alumni office directly. So I will read that one out. Um, they says, any advice for students that will possibly see COVID during rotations or residency and who will almost inevitably see another infectious disease outbreak during their careers and lifetime? Well, I would just say um, remain vigilant and now, make sure that you're always wearing the proper PPE, wash your hands, um, obviously, um, and sorry, what was this, the this, this, second, can you read the full question again? Sorry. I'm sure, no problem. A little, um, a little tired, sorry. No, totally understandable. Um, any advice for students that will possibly see COVID during rotations or residency and who will almost inevitably see other infectious disease outbreaks during their careers? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, you just have to always be, be careful, be aware, wear the PP that you need to wash your hands. Um, um, and definitely if you, if you are exposed to that, you just have to be aware of, you know, like who you're, um, who you're going to be uh, exposing that to. Um, just kind of want to make sure that you're protecting your family. If you have anyone that's, uh, at risk or if you, if you have any comorbidities that put you at risk, um, to be extra careful with that as well. Um, just um, be aware that there's always a possibility that this can happen again. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a terrible situation. Obviously, it's a great learning experience, but it's no one ever wished uh, that this would happen, obviously. Thank, 
Thank you for question. that, definitely. Um, we had one come in from someone that's listening, Kendrick. Um, have you had the opportunity to implement OMM into your practice? How has the treatment and management of COVID-19 changed over the past few months? As far as in, in general, um, yeah, in emergency medicine, I have uh, implemented uh, OMM uh, mostly for kind of diagnostic purposes, physical exam. Um, I've done some uh, soft tissue kind of muscle energy treatments. Um, I mean, it's not as, um, I mean, I'm not using it as much as I would if I uh, was uh, doing more of like a family man medicine type of uh, practice, um, working in an office, just because well, there are some liabilities involved. I'm doing certain techniques um, and just time constraints, but I, I, it definitely seems to help me with uh, uh, my approach to the patient and, and the physical exam in general, because obviously uh, one of the most common complaints that you see uh, during, uh, is uh, back pain, neck pain, just like a lot of musculoskeletal complaints. So it definitely helps out with that. Yes, thank you, Kendrick, for sending in that question. Um, I had one more that came in um, to the alumni inbox from a student. Um, they, you've talked a lot about your experience dealing with the pandemic and, and kind of what you've had to go through, maybe professionally, but. They wanted to know what lessons did you learn while working through New York's COVID crisis, either personally or um, professionally or more on a personal level? So on a, on a personal level, you know, I've learned during stressful times like this, obviously it's very important to enjoy your family, enjoy, enjoy the little things, just try to take uh, this moment to just enjoy the people, your loved ones, and um, obviously spending a lot, of, a lot of time with them. Just get outside, do things to kind of take your mind off of what's going on for a little bit. You have to, can't dwell on everything that work and everything that's going on in the world. You have to take your mind off of it. And then, like work-wise, I, I used to not, I mean, I've never been a germaphobe or anything like that. I'm not the guy that went into work and like cleaned off his, uh, his desk, disinfected his desk and everything like that in the computer and like, scrubbed everything down uh, prior to this. Um, and I don't know, afterwards, I don't know if I'm gonna be like the biggest germaphobe either, either but um, I definitely um, am more aware of uh, obviously uh, wearing, uh, wearing the proper PPE, just kind of protecting myself. I think that's great advice, you know, especially um, on the personal level that we can probably all um, heed, you know, spending time with our loved ones and enjoying what we can right now. So I think that was great. Um, another question from the audience, what are your favorite and least favorite parts of emergency medicine? Okay, actually the answer is kind of the same for both. <laughs> oh. Uh, so my favorite part of emergency medicine is that you get to see everything. Um, so there's no other specialty where you would go in and um, at one moment uh, have someone that's having a, a STEMI and then the next moment a stroke and then the shoulder dislocation and then uh, you know, pediatric patients, elderly patients, OB patients. Uh, you run the full gamut of everything from like very minor complaints to critically ill ICU level complaints. Um, and then that actually is one of my least favorite things though, because you do have to see everything. So there's not everybody's gonna, uh, you're, not everybody's gonna like every aspect of what you see. I mean, you see all the exciting, exciting things, but then you also have to, uh, you know, uh, get a lot of people with, that you see regularly for chronic pain and stuff like that, and you do obviously are at a at a at a high risk in the emergency department. You have a lot of patients that come in that are um, intoxicated on like methamphetamines and, and stuff like that that are uh, brought in by the cops, spitting at you and you know, trying to to swing at staff, and um, it's just. It just, you know, that, it's just that you have to, you see it, you get to see everything, but you also are responsible for seeing everything. And then I would say another thing about emergency medicine that I really love is um, the camaraderie, camaraderie with uh, everybody that I work with. Like I said earlier, it's a true team approach. 
there's no other specialty in medicine, I think, where you're going to um, work uh, with everybody as a team like that. And then lifestyle wise, I think it's great that you're working shifts and you have a lot of options in emergency medicine. So um, if you want to work in a, a big academic center and work with residents, then great. If not, you can work in a small community hospital. Um, when I was in the Air Force, I did moonlighting at this place that did 24 hour shifts. And it was uh, like a nine bed ER um, in a small town outside of Las Vegas. So it was very rural. So you have um, quite a variety. On top of that though, so you don't have to work call and you work shifts, but you will have to work nights and weekends and holidays though. So you'll have to work Christmas sometimes and Thanksgiving. And so so yeah. for lifestyle, it's good. Okay. Oh, but thank I definitely wouldn't choose any other Good. Well, thank you for sharing for sharing those. Um, Jill from the audience wants to know, um, she's curious about your thoughts on the reliability of the antibody testing. Did you catch that? <laughs> Which one? Uh, it cut out at the end. You were saying. Oh, so. sorry. Yeah, I can, I can read it again. It's a quick one. What are your thoughts on the reliability of the antibody testing? Yeah, um, I know there are a few different antibody tests that are out there. Um, I think the, the antibody test that we did at my hospital seems to be um, pretty reliable um, because there were all the people that I work with that I know um, uh, tested positive that were so there were a few people that are out of work that had um, COVID tested positive for COVID they did they ended up having testing positive for antibodies and people that I work with including myself uh, we, t we all got tested for antibodies and fortunately I was negative for antibodies which is actually it's good and bad I was hoping maybe I had a asymptomatic exposure or something developed antibodies but I guess it's good because I know that I was protecting myself and then I was wearing my PPE properly. I mean, I know there's going to be false negatives and false positives uh, for every test. Um, we still don't know it, how long you're going to be protected by antibodies and if you can get infected again. I guess there's some research that they're saying is coming out of South Korea that says that you will get some immunity from it, but we just don't know how long. And I know with any test that there's different companies making different tests and the sensitivity and specificity is going to be different. It seems like our test is pretty reliable just based on the fact that those people that were infected uh, tested positive. Sure. Well, good. Thank you. So um, Jill had one more question. Um, she said, wants to know what are your thoughts on the Kawasaki like disease we're seeing in children. She has a close friend whose child, just recovered from this after a hospital stay and she was tested three times for COVID with all results coming back negative. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, that news is that we're kind of hearing about with children. Well, it's terrifying. I'm glad she recovered. Um, but yeah, did they test positive for antibodies or did they uh, get tested for that? I don't know, Jill, do you wanna? I don't, um, I don't know if I'm unmuted. Oh, I don't yes, we can hear you. Okay. I don't know if they were she was tested for antibodies. I think she was. She was at Cook Children's, so. Yeah. Oh yeah, probably. Yeah. I bet she did. She was in great care, and supposedly she's fully recovered. And she had all the symptoms that I've heard about, you know, on the news and stuff. And they, but they, she never tested positive for COVID whatsoever. Mm -hmm. it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah, um, obviously it's very scary too because uh, initially uh, no one uh, really saw that uh, children were going to be that affected by this. Um, I personally have not seen any in my hospital yet. Our pediatric uh, visits have uh, decreased uh, significantly. We're starting to get some more kids to come back, but during the height of this, uh, we hardly had any kids come in and we usually see a decent number of kids. I mean, um, we're, a we're like a large community hospital, um, but uh, it's 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 pretty it's it's pretty scary. But I think 
Um, I think most, I know most of the kids are recovering from it, but it's just, it is, it's definitely concerning. Um, I wish I had some, well, I, I don't really want to have personal experience with that, but it would be helpful if I had personal experience with that. It's going to be interesting when we're trying to uh, figure out how to open back schools in the fall, though, too. Oh, yeah. Did it, so they recovered without any complications then? She doesn't have, as far as her dad has said, she doesn't have any complications. Thank God. I mean, it's been, it was literally this week. So um, I think she might have been in the hospital for three days. Um, so I'm not positive, you know, if there's anything long term, but um, she has made a recovery and she was released from the hospital. Okay. Well, that's, that's great. I, I know. Um... But I know some kids have been, been been really sick from this too, and some have uh, passed away from this. So that is scary. I know it's it's rare, but it's not rare enough. Right. Just, yeah, and I don't have any personal experience um, seeing this, but there's definitely been a, cases popping up everywhere. A lot in New York, just because we have the most of the majority of COVID cases in the nation. Well, like, thank you, Bill, for be able to, in a few months, maybe I'll be able to know more about that. Thank you. Thanks, Jill, for for sharing and, and asking that question. Um, I have another question from the audience. Diane wants to know how your team is preparing for any new spikes in cases that that we may see coming this fall. Oh, so yeah, I mean we're. I mean, we're mentally prepared for that all the time. We know that we're going to get spikes of cases. I mean, we're pretty sure we're going to get spikes of cases in the fall. I think it's inevitable. Um, I mean, we are definitely uh, stockpiling up on the PPE. Um, we have a plan to, uh, you know, obviously uh, transition back to uh, and closing off on the uh, elective surgery cases and kind of moving back to the same system that we have right now. I think we're just starting to open up elective surgery cases now in some of our hospitals. So, I mean, we are pretty prepared to move back to the way we are now. Um, uh, since we have so much experience with this, we're, we're definitely, we're, we're ready um, for, for this to happen again. Hopefully it's not, uh, I mean, hopefully it's not as bad as they say it's gonna be, but. Um, I apologize in advance if I pronounce anything in this next question wrong, but um, question came in. We see a lot of different things regarding the use of hydroxychloroquine used anecdotally. Have you or your colleagues used it at your hospital? What are your thoughts on this or other COVID management strategies? Okay, so we initially started using that at our hospital. Um, um, it was part of a clinical trial that we were doing, um, but we actually stopped using it because we weren't seeing any benefit from it. Um, uh, it was pretty much all admitted patients. That we didn't prescribe any to out, uh, people that were discharged uh, from the hospital, but not all of them were uh, uh, vented patients or ICU level patients, but um, I mean, it does have a lot of side effects though. I mean, cardiac side effects, I mean, it can lead to torsades, which can lead to cardiac arrest. I mean, very serious stuff. And one thing that struck me is that I had a patient that came in um, in April, like early April, uh, that has a history of lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And she wasn't able, she was on hydroxychloroquine for years for those conditions. And she wasn't able to get her medication because people were buying this and, or, or getting, asking their physicians to prescribe it. So. I don't know. I don't really have a positive, uh, anything really positive to say about hydroxychloroquine, to be honest, just because of people that need the medication weren't able to get it. And it's not really proven um, to provide any benefit. Like we've been uh, using it at um, one of our hospitals in the system, we've been using the remdesivir. And that seems to have some promise. I mean, there's just not enough. Um, not enough patients that have been on it. The studies, we haven't had, had time, the studies yet, but um, I mean, it kind of makes more sense because it's an antiviral medication instead of an anti-malarial medication. So it makes sense that it, 
that would work better. Obviously, every medication has side effects, but I mean, there's just no silver bullet. There's no magic bullet for this uh, disease. A lot of it's just kind of supportive care, and we're learning how um, different patients uh, are affected differently, and um, you know, even like, terrible the, snack. Terrible uh, snack. even on the ventilator, some are responding differently to the ventilator. Yeah. Well, I think that is all of the questions we had. So thank you to everyone that um, submitted questions and thank you, Dr. No, for answering. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for taking time to meet with us today. Um, if, do you have any kind of parting words of advice for our students and those who have just graduated as they continue on in their journey? Well, I was just going to say, well, thank you for having me. Um, best of luck to you guys. Um, enjoy um, uh, med school, enjoy residency. Um, it's one of the greatest times of your life, I think, um, to be honest. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So, and just stay positive. And Absolutely. Staying positive is great advice. Well, if anyone has additional questions, now's the time to ask. If not, then thank you so much again, Dr. O'Neill, for your time today and for your advice and just sharing your experiences. We definitely appreciate it. We hope that you have enjoyed this alumni conversation. If you have, great. Uh, we hope that you'll join us again in the future. Um, thank you so much again, and we hope that you have a wonderful day. Thank you.